Welcome to the Silicon Slopes podcast. I'm here with Sean Roylance, who's the founder and CEO of Rain Retail Software. How are you, Sean? Doing great, thanks. Thanks for taking the time to be here. Tell us about uh, Rain Retail Software. We'll just call it Rain. Yeah, yeah, Rain's great. And uh, the founding story and uh, a little bit of what you do, and then I've got some more questions. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So as far as what we do, um, what, what we are is we're, we're a point of sale, um, e-commerce and inventory management platform. Um, and so we kind of put that all together into one system. Uh, it's all cloud-based, it's all you know, SaaS uh, kind, kind of setup. And so a lot of times the way I describe it or the way I think about it is, you know how like with Walmart, you can go into the store and buy, you can go online and buy, you can buy online, return in store, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so we deliver that kind of functionality to your main street mom and pop retailers. Um, so it, we're really big in the craft industry. Um, we've been doing very well in musical instruments and in outdoor sporting goods uh, and, and other kinds of main street retail, retail stores. So uh, that's, kind of our, that's kind of our bread and butter. Um, but, but it really is like your, your mom and pop shops. Um, like our, our largest client has in the ballpark of 15 store locations. Most of our clients have just a single store location or maybe a couple of store locations. So, so that's what we cater to. Um, but it's kind of fun because, you know, the way we think about it is, you know, you have it, just about everybody has a main street, you know, that they, that they live near or grew up on or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you have Amazon, you have Walmart and, and those kinds of businesses that are coming in and, and putting pressure on these kinds of stores. And so the software that, that we deliver really kind of helps those those smaller local shops still be able to to compete, you know, with with the big boys out there. Yeah, which is important, um, especially for people like me. I uh, haven't frequented Walmart in probably fifteen years, and I've never bought anything on Amazon. Um, <laughs> okay, and, you're, you're our customer, <laughs> or our customer's customer, I should say. Exactly, and uh, I love. Main Street and uh, Ma and Pa, and uh, I love that you know there's solutions out there that kind of level the playing field a little bit. So SaaS, I think that's pretty well understood. So do you guys also have the, the hardware and the software? How do you uh, ultimately get it into the customer's hands? Yeah, um, for us, it's, it's, it's just the software. Um, the majority of the clients that we sign up, they, they already – um, you know, that they've had a point of sale previously. They have, you know, most of the hardware and stuff that they need. Um, and typically it's going to be just, a, it's a desktop or a laptop computer set up at the check, the checkout stand. And so, um, ours is all cloud-based. It all runs in a browser. So as long as they can pull up a browser, then, then we're good to go. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and then if they need hardware, then we just point them to like a third party and say, go get it here. Okay. But. Yeah, you, you asked about the startup. I didn't really yeah. really get into that. Um, so it's uh, I'm not going to say it's a very sexy story here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I graduated in computer science. In fact, I I grew up on a farm in Washington State, in the middle of middle of the state, in the farming com uh, country there. And growing up on the farm, my whole goal was get off the farm. Yep. <laughs> um, I my my parents bought a, a, a little computer when I was like 12. And so I learned how to program on it. I think I might have been the only kid in my high school who programmed at that time. It was a few years ago. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and so I knew I liked that. I, I went to BYU, did computer science. And by the time I graduated was when I started to realize I liked business as well. But I already had a job, already making, you know, already kind of had the golden handcuffs thing going on and, yeah. you know, that, that type of thing. So it took me about a dozen years trying different things. I didn't want to ask my my wife and kids to, you know, go the startup route and no revenue and you know that that that, that type of path. Yeah. So um, so tried several things to, on the side. Didn't work. Didn't work. Um, finally had this idea. Um, so my wife is a quilt pattern designer. So this is the real you know sexy techie part of the, yeah. the story. <laughs> um, and so. So, so, so she, she had this quilt pattern uh, or this quilt hanging on the wall. And I told her, I'm like, I could write a program that could create the full instructions to, to, you know, build this quilt. 
And she's like, no way, you can't do that. And, and, and while I realize that my wife's always right, um, I, <laughs> about eight hours <laughs> later, <laughs> I, I had a, a, a program of spitting out designs and, and n- another hundred hours later, um, software that, that could generate, I estimated about 11 billion quilt patterns. Wow. Um, and so we took that and took that to uh, a show with, along with her, par- uh, her patterns, a trade show. And while we're there, somebody walks up to me and it's like, hey, we do websites for people in this industry. And I liked what, what they had, and I felt like that that um, th- there's you know improvements that could be made on on that kind of an offering. So on the plane flight back, sketched out you know the whole back of the napkin story, um, came up with a business plan, worked for the next six months until the next trade show, put together the first version of the content management system, and went back and and signed up our first um, I think it was 24 customers uh, there. Um, then. Uh, Got going into it a couple months later. Quit my full time job. Did started doing this full time. Then I realized you actually do get to go without pay for you know some period of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I talked two founding partners into joining me somehow, um, and uh, and we got going. And so we started out with e commerce. Um, and and what we realized, and this was kind of the cool thing for us, was this is like you know 2010 to 2012 ish. Mm-hmm. Um, it sounds like a no brainer now. Looking back, I was like, well, duh, but at that time it wasn't. Um, and what, what we found was that when we could help a store get all their products online with their current inventory levels and their current pricing and stuff, that it actually drove a lot of in-store traffic. People go and kind of check it out online first and then they go into the store and, the, and then they buy. Um, but the problem was was that most store owners, they just don't have the time, you know, whatever, to, to keep it up to date. Yeah. We made it super, super easy. It still wasn't easy enough. Um, and so that's when we had the idea, let's put the point of sale together with this, um, so that they run their point of sale like normal. And then that just keeps the, the website, the e-commerce website up to date automatically. They don't have to lift a finger. Um, and, and so that's what we did and, and launched that product in 2013. Um, and that was really kind of, in a lot of ways you could argue was the real start to the real business that, that we have today. Okay. So like a surf shop with uh, your product and services would know how many surfboards yeah. they have in inventory yep. as an example. So it kind of ties it all in together. Yeah, they put it on sale, it's on sale instantly. And you can have separate prices if you want to, but generally speaking, you want what's on the website to reflect what's in the store as well. Um, and until COVID hit, um, the, the majority of sales that were influenced by the website, didn't the transaction did not take place on the website. We could measure, like like our clients on average in, in year one, their total revenue grows by 20% from when they sign up with us during the first 12 months. Um, but, uh, but, but the vast majority of that still occurred in store. So mm. it really just, it kind of started the buying journey, but, but people still finished it in store. And so you're able to discern that through um, somebody who's looking at a red sweater in a boutique five or six times and then they end up buying it two days later in the boutique? Yes and no. Um, I mean, maybe we're taking too much credit. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but the, the big thing that, that we know is we know the industry averages. Okay. And and so then then we see the growth that our customers experience and and what what they're experiencing during those first 12 months is is 20% more. And, and then we can also see, you know, month one what it was, what month 12 is, and, yeah. and, and, and see those trends. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it absolutely got to give credit to the store owners for sure, hundred yeah. percent. Um, and 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 you could certainly argue that some of them they're on a good path anyway. Yeah. Um, but industry averages here, our clients, you know, going up. Yeah, of all the KPIs and metrics out there, that's a pretty easy one to understand. <laughs> month one versus month twelve. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, I assume you've got the usual marketing strategies of getting your product in front of these folks, but is uh, word of mouth with these small retailers important? Word of mouth is definitely important for us, for sure. You know, you're right. We, you follow the normal strategies, the SEO, PPC, email, etc. Word of mouth is big. Uh, another one for us, a couple that are maybe a little out of the ordinary. Um, one is we actually still do physical mailers. Um, and, yeah. and, and then we do cold calling and we cold call behind those physical mailers. Um, and so that just kind of warms it up for people a little bit. Um, and, and then trade shows, 
Except for last year. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so every last year, it's that's always been a critical part for us. Yeah. How many trade shows a year do you guys try to do? Uh, we've been in the ballpark of 15 to 20. Okay. Um, as, as things come back online and, and we're making progress in a couple different areas, you know, that's probably going to bump up, if anything. Okay. All right. So you did mention COVID and impacts, but um, it's pretty easy to see the impact of COVID on a main street bakery yeah. or boutique or surf shop. And then how did that trickle down to you guys? Yeah. You know, it, it, a whole variety of ways. Um, the, the first one is, uh, you know, as soon as it just really kind of hit hard and, you know, in, in March of last year, um, is it, it was like around March 12th or something where, where just everything kind of went off a cliff and, and you could see it in transaction volume, mm -hmm. um, across the whole country that, that it just one day it was normal. And the next day it was just, just dramatic drop. Um, and, and so what we did is, is, is immediately we, we built in a feature and within, I think it was within two or three business days, had out a curbside pickup, um, and, and then like pay at pickup and, and that kind of feature, uh, to my knowledge for a platform like ours, we were the first one out there that was able to deliver those kinds of features for people. Um, and, and you could see, uh, there, there's still, you know, this two week just drop, 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 drop. Um, and then around the beginning of April, uh, kind of bottomed out and, and then started coming coming back up again. Um, for us, you know, our clients, you know, they were hurting for sure. Um, I'll I'll say though that that it's surprising to me that if you look at the number of store closures um, from the the prior year and then look at the total store closures from last year, whether they cited COVID as a reason or not, that that it was up a little bit but it wasn't up that much for our client base at least. So yeah. this is kind of what I call specialty retail, you know, a lot of hobby kind of retail stores. Um, they really pushed through and, and weathered the storm. Um, and, and so there, there wasn't the, this huge uptick in closures. What we did see is that, that um, you know, that, that optimism about where your business is going, the confidence of where, you know, what the future holds, that certainly took a big hit. And so from a sales standpoint, it makes the sales conversation a lot harder when you're saying, Hey, you know, Mr. Store owner or Mrs. Store owner, um, you have, you know, here's some software that can help you. It's going to cost this much money up front and, and ongoing, whatever, um, for them to pull the trigger on, 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 a, you know, an outlay of, of an expense when, when they're not sure what next month is going to bring, you know, made it a, a harder sale. We still got a lot of sales. Um, but, but it's more complicated for sure. Yeah. Well, um, moving fast within two days to have curbside and <laughs> that is uh, pretty intuitive and uh, I'm sure your customers appreciated that. Yes. Yeah. You know, we, we had a bunch of customers in states where they pretty much just said, you can't even have your store open. Yeah. Um, and, and so we, we had stores, um, you know, all over the country that were like, thank you so much. This, this saved my business kind of thing. Yeah. And, and then so many other ones where it had a big impact. Um, you know, one of the things that, that, that we're able to see that, that as far as the segment of retail stores goes, um, if you're a brick and mortar retailer, just kind of broadly speaking, you know, the vast, vast majority of your sales were occurring in store. Like, you know, um, I'll speak loosely, I'll call it 95 percent ish. Mm -hmm. Those sales were occurring in store and, and, and the other five ish was occurring online um, at the peak of, of kind of the, you know, the, the, the real scare or shutdowns or whatever. Um, that shifted to uh, about one third, two thirds. Okay. So, so you went from five percent to a full third of your sales, um, on average at least, occurring online versus versus in store. Yeah. So, yeah, big big impact. That's come back down, but I think that there's you know we're seeing evidence that just consumer behavior um, is probably permanently altered at least a little bit. Yeah. Um, to where more and more's uh, gonna just permanently happen online. But, but in some ways for, for physical retail stores, you can maybe make an argument that, that this has actually helped consumers realize that, oh, actually my, you know, my, my local store, I can do business with them online. Um, I don't have to go in store all the time. Yeah. And so, so that helps kind of develop those behavioral patterns, you know, that, that I think will be nice, you know, in future years. Yeah. Buy something at 3 PM or 3 AM. <laughs> exactly. All right. And then, uh, kind of. Fun, I guess, to see pretty real-time data yeah. on what's happening in uh, the Main Street retail, right? Like you guys had a pretty good idea. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. 
Yeah, we don't have to worry about like what the news is reporting. We know what the truth is. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's funny how that works. Um, very cool. And uh, as you know, founder and CEO, um, I ask this question quite frequently on the podcast. Um, how do you divide your duties? Uh, where do you focus your time and energy? Um, do you kind of focus what you're good at and what you enjoy? Or do you have to uh, keep your finger on the pulse of the entire company? Um, so that answer has changed over time. Um, early on, since I had the, the tech background you know, and, and so on, I was the, the initial programmer and then led our initial you know, team as, as we started to form a development team and so on. Um, I have my, my two founding partners. We've been very fortunate in that we've, our, our natural talents, abilities, interests have been super complimentary. Um, initially, you know, my, my partner, Brian, um, he did uh, the sales and we kind of collaborated on marketing. And then Milo was the do everything else guy. Yeah. <laughs> he, he was the guy who's, who's kind of, uh, you know, very detail oriented, made sure there's so much else to happen in the company, made sure it all got done. Yeah. Um, the, uh, but, but where it's shifted lately, um, besides, besides the, uh, you know, the software side, I, I'm naturally inclined towards numbers. Yeah. And so as we've needed to develop KPIs and, and, and really manage the, the business at a little bit more of a sophisticated level that just kind of came naturally to me. And so a few years ago I shifted out of programming and, and sadly haven't really hardly touched it since. Um, but, but I kind of, you know, manage the company in, in that fashion you know, really from a numbers based uh, standpoint. I also still feel that, that like the personal connection is super, super important and really push that within the company, you know, uh, as, as a priority. Um, but, uh, but, but the numbers, you know, gotten, I think pretty good at, at being able to use the numbers to, to manage the business. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, we were talking a little bit beforehand and, uh, on a phone call earlier, um, the numbers are adding up because, uh, you guys were acquired by a private equity group recently. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's it's one of those things. My, my my partners give me a hard time about this. When when we first started the business, my my goal, I, I think, it was really I probably had two goals. One was do this, you know, start a business, and and the second one, from a financial standpoint at least, was pay off the house. Yeah, <laughs> that that was my goal. Um, and 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 then as things got going along, and and you know, after that 2013 launch of the of the combined point of sale inventory management e commerce um, platform. I think that's when we really started to see the potential of the business and that had so much more of a potential. Um, but, but even then, you know, like, do you go after VC money? Do you go after private equity money? Do you, do you sell? Um, and, and, and when on all those questions. And, and so we started to, to ask, you know, those kinds of questions or people asked us those questions. Um, we started getting calls. It feels like maybe around 2015, 2016, um, you know, we're just, just, eventually calls and emails, just a constant, yeah. you know, it's just a constant stream of, of those. Um, and so, so I started fielding those after a while because I thought I'm going to need to at least know how to talk the talk and, and answer the questions and know what are the numbers that they're concerned about and, and that type of stuff. So I started doing that, but, but for us, we even kind of explored it, but just wasn't the right time, wasn't the right time. Um, and until it was December um, before COVID, and we actually decided, all right, now's now is the time. We're going to find a private equity group. VC was never our path. Yeah, as you know, a VC can be a great path for people, um, but but one of the things I feel like maybe a lot of times isn't romanticized so much is mm -hmm. there. There's a non VC route also. Yeah. Um and 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 so so that that was the right route for us, um, but we thought about maybe selling it. But what we, what we really wanted was let's find a PE group where, where we can sell some of it, you know, take some chips off the table, um, de-risk a little bit there, but that also kind of saw the, the vision of what we could still accomplish, um, you know, where we could do, you know, organically, but then also inorganic kind of growth opportunities as well. And, and so we, we hired an investment banker, um, started the process, and, and the investment banker, this is December, and he's like, you know, we could find a buyer in, in, in two weeks if you want. Hmm. Um, it's like, but if you want to do it right, you know, the, here's this six month process that they outline. I'm like, all right, we'll do it right. Because I mean, it's only going to take like a, some major disaster to derail this at this point. Right. 
And so COVID, I swear, wasn't my fault. <laughs> we didn't tempt fate or anything. Um, anyway, COVID came right in the middle of that, just killed it. Uh, then as we got, you know, we we'll worked through the summer and stuff in the fall, the the group, we, you know, the, the investment banker kind of, kind of came back around. was like, hey, look, conversations are heating up. We should run the process. We kind of ran through the process and, and ultimately said, no, mm. we're not doing it. We just couldn't find someone who shared the vision that we wanted to do. Because we still have a lot of energy for the business, we had have we still have a lot of energy for the business, so we said no. Um, and then in March of this year, um, uh, one of the private equity groups that I had previously connected with reached back out to us and more or less, you know, repeated the exact vision to us that 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 we had outlined um, for ourselves that we wanted. And so at that point, we're like, okay, yep, yeah, this this is it. Finally, finally, the time is right. Um, and so we kind of went on an accelerated process because I told them, I'm like, look, we've kind of been down this road. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't for us. Um, if you're serious, then, then, then let's do it. Let's do it fast. Let's not waste time yeah. and, and let, let's get on with things. And, and so, so we did, we did, did it fast as about two, two and a half months, um, to, to go through the whole process, start, start to finish. Um, and, and it was a lot of work, you know, there's, they ask, they'll ask you for the numbers. Um, but then they want the absolute proof of all the numbers that you say. And, and who do you have agreements with? Okay, now we want the absolute proof of all the agreements you have. And it's, it's a lot of work. I, I, I often wondered how people say it's a lot of work. How can it be a lot of work? Well, it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but now we're, we're into it, and, and we rolled a lot of ownership forward still. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we kind of have our plan you know, for the next several years. Um, and, and super excited about, uh, you know, where it's going. And, and the thing that's kind of cool about this is, is on our own, you know, we had like kind of a natural trajectory that we were on, but now that we've partnered with this private equity group, that trajectory is already just completely changing. Okay. Um, and, and so kind, kind of fun to be part of, you know, being able to, to really step on the gas in a way that we never could have, you know, on our own. Yeah. Yeah, it is a lot of work if somebody just keeps asking you questions, right? <laughs> yep, yep, for sure. <laughs> That'll keep anyone busy. And uh, yeah, if due diligence done right, it is very diligent, Yeah, to yep. say the least. Well, that's quite the experience from uh, the, the quilting show and uh, whipping <laughs> up a, a program to kind of a, an end goal for a lot of entrepreneurs, which is take some chips off the table or sell the whole business. Yeah. Very cool. Um yeah, thank you again so much for uh, taking the time. Couple, one more question. Uh huh. Um, it's football season, right? <laughs> and yeah. predictions for the BYU Cougars and Seattle Seahawks. Yeah. Um, so Seahawks Super Bowl win for sure. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think they go to the playoffs again. Um, and 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 once you're in the playoffs, who knows? You know, the Giants won a few years back when they were the wild card. Yep. We had a couple wild card winners, so. So just get your foot in the door and then, and then see what happens. Um, love Russell Wilson, uh, lifelong Seahawks fan since the 70s. Yeah. Uh, Cougars, same thing, lifelong, lifelong Cougars fan. Um, love what they did last year. This year I'm, I'm very uh, curious to see with, with a, a bit of a step up in competition. Um, and, and without Zach Wilson, you know, are they going to be able to, to repeat what they did? But they have so many pieces. You know, it seems like the, the, the team is as deep as they've been you know, in, in, in years. Um, so, so very excited to see what they're able to do this year. Yeah. Um, prediction though, uh, I, I don't know. Um, I, 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 I gotta go with my heart. Um, we gotta say double digit wins. Double digit wins. So, yep. All right. And, uh, I think that Seahawks made the playoffs with like a seven and nine record not that long ago, right? The, so that was their first, uh, and the, and the, under Pete Carroll, the, yeah. um, their first playoff appearance, and that's when uh, the the beast quake happened. When Marshawn Lynch yep. went like sixty five yards and ran through the entire Saints defense. Beast quake. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very cool. Thank you, Sean, for taking the time. Yeah, absolutely. My my uh, my pleasure. You bet. <laughs>